Hello, everybody. Welcome to Think Out, the monthly debate series of the Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. At the Institute of Science and Technology for Humanity, we address societal challenges through transdisciplinary team research, combining the latest in science and engineering with deep domain knowledge from social sciences, humanities, business, and the arts. In each Think Out, we bring together the leading researchers and industries from very different disciplinary backgrounds to discuss and debate an important question the world is facing. This is Health Thinkout, which we organize between the NIST Institute and NTU's Li Kong Chang School of Medicine. It is a series of healthcare centered expert discussions on a wide range of topics at the crossroads of medical sciences and other disciplines. We address issues that greatly impact people's lives. This inaugural Health Think Out seeks to delve into the field of plastic particles and how it is affecting our health, directly or indirectly, and what can be done to counter the adverse effects. Microplastics are fragments of any type of plastic, less than five millimeters in length. These and other types of particles from synthetic materials cause pollution by entering natural ecosystems from a variety of sources, including cosmetics, clothing, food packaging, and industrial processes. And today we address the question, how much do we know about microplastics and the human body? And how is it affecting our daily lives and health? My name is Vanessa Everest, and together with my colleague, Lim Kaliong, we will moderate this debate. So over to you, Kaliong, to introduce our experts for today's debate. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. I hope everyone can hear me okay. It's such a pleasure to co-host this session with you, Vanessa, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kaliong, the Vice Dean for Research at the Li Kong Chen School of Medicine at NTU. So just to shout out a few quick words about our school. At LKC Medicine, we train doctors who put patients at the center of their exemplary care, and we aim to be a model of innovative medical education and a center for transformative research. So at this special medical think up, we intend to explore medical and healthcare topics ranging from technology for the elderly care to behavioral aspects of chronic care and prevention, and how the broader environment could affect our health, amongst others. So the inaugural medical thinker will showcase the research and expertise of two of our NTU scientists, Professor Shane Snyder and Associate Professor Sunny Wong. Now, before I introduce today's speaker, I would like the audience to answer the poll question that will appear on your screen very shortly. It reads, do you think we should be concerned about microplastic to our environment and health? And you have a few options. Definitely yes, probably yes, maybe, probably no, definitely no. Now we'll revisit this after the discussion to see if it sway your opinion in any other direction. Please, I ask you to use the Q&A to ask a question and also to provide your feedback. Now we would appreciate if you could add your name and affiliation to the Q&A entry. So just to run through the format uh, very quickly, after the intro and poll, we will hear from our speakers followed by the Q&A session and that would uh, be uh, succeeded by a final poll. Okay, and now give me great pleasure to introduce our speakers uh, for this session. First is uh, Professor Shane Schneider. Uh, professor Schneider is a professor of civil and environmental engineering and is the executive director of Nanyang Environment and Water Research Institute, in short, uh, NURI at NTU in Singapore. Dr. Schneider was awarded the prestigious Prize in 2021 in recognition of his valuable contribution to the scientific field of water science and technology through his diverse research in water quality, treatment, as well as sustainability. Now, he currently serves as an editor-in-chief for the International Journal Chemosphere. And as an illustration uh, of his key opinion leadership, Dr. Schneider has been invited to brief the Congress of the United States on three occasions on emerging issues in water quality. Finally, he is also a fellow of the International Water Association and a member of the World Health Organization Drinking Water Advisory Panel. 
Our speaking, our second speaker, I beg your pardon for today, is Associate Professor Sunny Wong, who is a clinician scientist and a prominent gastroenterologist at the NTU LKC Medicine, whose main interest is on gut microbiome, investigating the host microbe interaction in digestive as well as in metabolic diseases and exploring this for discovery of novel biomarkers and therapeutics. Sunny has won several awards, including the Asia Pacific Digestive Week Emerging Leadership Lectureship in 2021, the Sir David the Todd Lectureship in 2020, the Lo Ying Sheikh Chi Wai Foundation Meritorious Research Award in 2020, and finally the Groucher Foundation Award in 2014. Uh, Dr. Sunny Wong is also the program director of our newly launched Center for Microbiome Medicine, a research facility that aims to improve human health and find new ways to treat diseases by leveraging on the microbiome, which are naturally present microorganisms that play a vital role in our well being. With him at the helm, the facility will focus its research in the areas of nutrition and metabolism, airway and environment cancers as well as infections and other neurological and skin diseases. Now with the gut at the primary entry of whatever we ingest, you can imagine the impact, uh, potential impact of microplastic to our gut microbiome. So on that note, uh, please welcome Professor Shane Schneider as well as Professor Sunny Wong uh, for their opening statement. Over to you, Shane. Okay, thank you. First of all, I just wanted to thank the organizers for inviting me, and I'm excited to be part of this and look forward to the participation. So I'm going to try to share my screen if it works, but it's not really critical. Let's see if we can do this. Okay, so hopefully you can see my screen. So I just wanted to kick it off by um, telling everyone, I know it's going to be a bit of a debate, so maybe I can start by saying plastics will be with us forever. We're not going to phase out plastics from the planet. In fact, Plastics were first invented, depending on who you ask, around 1862 as a substitute for ivory, right? Ivory coming from the tusks of uh, elephants. So, you know, we don't want to go too far back in time where we're, we're, we're destroying wildlife to try to get uh, an alternative. Around 1907, though, the plastics were, were patented and um, what was unique then is that they contain no natural molecules. That's kind of an interesting one versus what was developed in the 1860s. So I'm gonna share with you a bit now. I, I'm coming from a perspective of a chemist and engineer, not as a medical doctor. So I would keep that in mind, but let's uh, see if we can get this. Okay. So first of all, I'm sure all of you have heard about this. I don't want to dwell on it. I only have a few minutes. But the amount of garbage in our oceans, for instance, just one aspect of the exposure, is just daunting. I mean, no matter what we feel about whether or not this is relevant to public health, we got a, a big mess that we, we need to deal with and try to prevent from the future. And this is just an example of one of the many garbage patches, I think there are more than 10 in different sections of the world's ocean. And this particular one, the Great Pacific, is about 2,200 times bigger than the entire country of Singapore, if you can imagine that. And where is this stuff coming from, right? It's coming from all kinds of places. And what may shock you and maybe scare you a bit is that most of it's coming from clothing, textiles. That is the number one source of uh, microplastics in the environment. Ultimately, um, a lot of synthetic fibers in our, in our clothing and, and other things we use. Um, tires are the number two source. A lot of people don't realize that. And I'm gonna show um, um, a, an aspect of car tire shedding that I do think is concerning not only to human health, but also potentially uh, to environmental health in general. So what about this plastic pollution? You know, again, people are being exposed to it. There are a lot more of it maybe than we even expected. The irony perhaps is that the benefit of plastic is that it is very relatively inexpensive to make and it is very strong, very durable, but that also leads to these negatives. So there's a lot of efforts globally to try to limit the amount of plastics in the ocean, to try to limit the amount that we are exposed to, and to build new types of polymers that are uh, 
more biodegradable. But I want to make a, another maybe controversial comment. We don't want most of our plastics to be biodegradable. Of course, plastic bottles, plastic bags, single-use plastic, that's kind of low-hanging fruit in terms of maybe what we could replace. But do you really want a biodegradable car? Do you want a biodegradable uh, uh, housing, uh, carpeting, et cetera? Likely, probably not. Um, and again, we see that there are microplastics of all different compositions, including, as you just saw, mainly from textiles and car tires, and also some as intentional ingredients. And if we look again at the world's rivers, a, a place that I've been working in, Kathmandu and the Bagmati River, it's literally full of plastics. They try to clean it up one week and within a week later, it's full of plastic again. So I'm gonna to come to at least a little good news in, in the final minute about what we can do to maybe prevent some of this exposure. Now, what I also wanted to say is that there's two aspects, I think, you know, when it comes to thinking about whether or not these microplastics are relevant to our health. First of all, it's the particle itself. And I think a lot of work has been focused on those particles and whether the particles can have different deleterious effects to the body. But the area that we study more is actually what leaches from these microplastics and what kind of uh, materials may stick to them and be transported. In other words, the microplastic as a matrix uh, during decomposition or uh, things that stick to it. And one of, the, one of the interesting ones was I mentioned was car tires. There was this paper that I'm showing here uh, from the University of Washington. Uh, it was published in Science, which uh, you know is something I have as a career goal and have never done, but my friend Edward Kolotsky was able to publish this paper and, and basically saying that these uh, chemicals that are originating from the microparticles released from tires are among the most toxic ever seen in history uh, to salmonid fish and may have caused them to um, uh, population to decline. In general, I show another paper, hopefully you can see it in the bottom left uh, from my research group and my colleagues, where we started to look at, you know, when these uh, plastics enter the ocean, they get into the stomach of a fish, for instance, what do they leach and what does it do to the animal? And we did discover that uh, in vitro, which means we work in cell groups, uh, in vitro meaning uh, like human cells that we expose to these types of chemicals, we can see deleterious effects for sure. And sometimes from things we don't even expect, like in the car tire story, of course, a lot of car tires everywhere and whether you use an electric vehicle or a combustion vehicle is irrelevant, it'll still have tires. In fact, electric vehicles leach more particles from their tires than do combustion vehicles because they're intrinsically more heavy. Um, but what we discovered is that those chemicals that are leaching from the particles, if we chlorinate them during water treatment, can be extremely genotoxic. In fact, the most genotoxic I've ever seen in my entire career. So if we think about even here in Singapore, where we build catchments to capture urban runoff, we definitely need to be thinking about this aspect of uh, microplastics, if you will. But again, I said I'd end with some <laughs> potentially good news, at least in, we are trying hard to find ways to upcycle plastic waste. Now that will not by any stretch solve this. It will not eliminate the fibers that are leaching from our clothing, but at least for the single use plastic, again, maybe the low hanging fruit, you know, we can actually encourage people to return that plastic back and we can convert it into products like oils or nanostructures. Uh, here at Nuri, we developed and patented and created a spinoff company to take waste plastic and create value, uh, especially in carbon nanostructures. So I only had seven minutes and I think I've used 6.5. So um, I have my information, I'm sure you can find it, but I'm gonna stop and turn it over to my colleague, Professor Wong. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you uh, for Shinana. Uh, and uh, as a, it was a great introduction, and uh, that's the uh, the stage uh, for our further discussion. Uh, I am Associate Professor Sunny Wong, and uh, in contrast, I'm not a chemist. I come from the medical uh, angle. I'm a clinician, and also I work on uh, the microbiome. Uh, I'm a scientist as well. So uh, the I have a few slides as well. Um, so uh, maybe just to walk you through some of the um, background uh, in this area. So uh, Shane uh, has uh, nicely given us. 
a background on uh, plastics and how, uh, how, how much waste that we have in the environment. And also uh, some uh, of these plastic eventually become microplastic. And we know that they are just everywhere. So uh, I don't think we are going to ever uh, get away with them. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, they're everywhere, but uh, how deep do they get into our body to affect our health and also uh, how relevant it is uh, to our present and also future health. Uh, so uh, just uh, one picture showing you uh, the, the, the scale that we are looking at. So we are talking about microplastic, but actually they do range uh, between the sizes of a few uh, millimeter, the largest of them, and throughout the micro micron scale and also actually down to the uh, nano scale as well. So these are highly relevant because uh, depending on size, actually, uh, we know that they are in the environment, but once they get into the biological system, so depending on the size, they actually uh, determine what, uh, what, what permeates into what organs. Uh, so you can see that actually once uh, actually in the kind of uh, the smaller micro and then also the nanoscale, they get into the cells quite easily. So you can see that they might get through the gastrointestinal barrier, they might get into different cells, or if they are even smaller, they can actually cause uh, what we call the brain barrier. That is the barrier that protects and isolate, segregate us from uh, the brain, from the rest of the body, and that's also the placenta as well. So you can see that the um, sizes are indicated here and the red ones are that of uh, comparison with uh, the biological objects. And also uh, that also determines how much they are going to affect uh, put our health potentially. And uh, of course they are everywhere. And uh, so once uh, we want to in, 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 invade once they uh, go through the biological systems, uh, there are the, uh, a few ways uh, that can get into our body. So I'm a gastroenterologist, so I would say that uh, the injections is uh, important and they are also probably the source uh, of where um, many of these microplastics are, get, are getting through our body. But also we know that the uh, inhalation, uh, the respiratory roots, uh, uh, we are breathing air every day. So, it's, uh, so this route is also very important. The other, of course, are uh, the direct contact with uh, our skin. So uh, that uh, although not all, of, all, all the plastic they go through our skin, so depending on the size, uh, but uh, the skin, the dermal contact is, of course, very important as well. So this is a uh, summary uh, that uh, shows you how uh, important uh, they are of different roots. You can see that uh, many of these microplastics, they are in the bottled water, they are in the beer. So uh, if you are thinking of uh, going uh, to the pub, uh, so maybe next thing that you, you, you don't want to think about is uh, that there are microplastic in there as well. And uh, seafood, you will see, uh, because uh, many of these plastics are in the marine environment and also as well as in the air and also other um, food and uh, other substances as well. So, uh, and of course uh, we could consume them directly and many of them actually go through the bio ecosystem through the food chain. So uh, uh, majority of them are in the marine environment. So they accumulate through the uh, food chain and eventually reach us as well. And so you can see in this slide that yes, they are here already if you didn't know. So they are in our every part of our body. So these are studies and actually these are news that were on the media that you can see that they are virtually in many parts of our different tissues. Uh, so uh, blood, uh, it was uh, reported uh, just a few months ago. So uh, it was on the headline of Guardian and many other news media as well. But uh, subsequently they found them, some of them found them in stool. There were studies uh, a few years back, but also in liver tissues, uh, in placenta, and also in the breast milk that I think just came out a few um, uh, weeks ago that, uh, that they are in the breast milk. Uh, so the news was uh, there quite recently. And of course, uh, the question is, uh, they are there and, and so what? Do they really exert an effect? Uh, so you can see that uh, they, um, uh, there are some studies. Uh, so uh, this is the question that we have in mind today. So uh, we will discuss a bit further. Before going into that, we also know that uh, plastic are not only plastics. Uh, so they could be direct effects from the plastic or the microplastic, but also they harbor different chemicals that can come from their manufacturer. So there can be additive chemicals, there can be other potentially toxic chemicals. And also importantly, they can be vector for microbes and pathogens. So they are not only the plastic, but they carry with them other 
chemical and biological entities as well. So these are some of the uh, a summary of uh, some of the studies that were reported before. Uh, I would mind you that uh, these are not uh, all human studies. So some of these studies are based on cellular model, some are based on animal models, and some are based on association studies. And of course, uh, so I'm just highlighting two uh, that are um, new ones uh, that, that potentially uh, would uh, be relevant. So for example, this one look, uh, you can see that this is uh, in vitro model. So looking at um, consortium of microbes and studying how these microbes can potentially change some of these uh, microbes uh, inside this uh, in vitro model. And there's also, for example, new association studies in human that look at people with uh, disease called colitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and healthy individuals and comparing the amount of uh, microplastic that were found. But I want to also to mind you uh, that is relevant to the poll that we did uh, today is also the biological plausibility. We know that a correlation doesn't equal uh, 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 a causation. So I'm sure that this is a very informed group and you will know what I mean that uh, although correlations association are there, so we need to be um, sensitive about this uh, biological possibility. And it takes uh, quite a lot more uh, from different uh, studies, uh, uh, observational and also uh, animal or cell line studies to really establish the causality. So I think this is an important concept that we need to understand as well. So I think uh, I will stop here and uh, I, have taken seven minutes and uh, on time and uh, look forward to the discussion section. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Shane and Sunny. This is so interesting. Uh, we'll, we'll kick off uh, the discussion for now. Um, be interesting to see uh, the poll. You can see that a lot of people, actually everybody is kind of concerned about uh, plastic particles in our environment and, and in our bodies. So definitely yes, probably yes, and maybe have all the votes. Uh, so let's see, let's see what uh, what today's session will bring. I, I think mostly you guys have both mentioned this is obviously happening. This is something that is already these this stuff is already in our bodies. Kind of hard to say how it is affecting our health. I understood. So is there is there any information you can give us about what we really know about how how plastics or these particles of, for instance, car tires are not just affecting salmon, but but also us, people. Is there anything you can say about that for now? Um, I think what we see is that uh, we do have a lot of uh, studies uh, looking at their potential impact. So uh, many of these studies are, for example, some I've mentioned are cell lines. They are looking at some cellular effects. So for example, adding some of these plastic in, what are the effects? And uh, as we mentioned, we are not only looking at the plastic, but also some of the additive, some of the chemicals. And uh, I think uh, there are studies supporting that uh, they do inflict changes on a cellular level, uh, oxidative stress, and also uh, some even uh, looking at um, mutations and cell stress. Uh, and there are studies in animal models as well. So for example, in, 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 in laboratory model, but also uh, I think from environmental samples as well. So uh, yeah, that what is lacking is a, a direct uh, human studies. Uh, so um, we do see observational studies, uh, but in terms of the causality, like uh, if we are looking at human cells, uh, there aren't so much that we are seeing. And so I think that is uh, where the controversy lies. So, so we don't actually know if it is impacting our health negatively. Uh, we need, um, maybe we need something more to really prove, uh, but there are evidence, uh, circumferential evidences around. Okay, so so we most likely expect it to impact our health, which we just don't don't know exactly. In the mm. in the case of fish, we can be a little bit more certain, and I, I guess it's a much more direct uh, attitude. And, and Shane, is there anything? I mean. We're uh, in, in located in Singapore. Uh, a lot of people from the audience are not from Singapore, but is there a local element to this? Is there a particular type of uh, material that we would be more susceptible for in Singapore than elsewhere or less perhaps? Is, is there is this a universal or local thing? Or to what extent? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question, but I'll, I'll give a couple quick responses to it. First of all, you know, Southeast Asia in general is essentially ground zero for plastic in the ocean. Majority of it is coming from this part of the world. Now, not Singapore in particular, but our region. Um, so in terms of the ocean contamination, uh, we are definitely in a, in, a, in a hot zone and we can perhaps help with what we're learning and 
try to limit those exposures a bit more um, with some of our upcycling. But um, the second part of it, though, I think that living in a highly dense urban environment will make it a bit of a unique um, susceptibility. I mean, we are in, in a place that is, is very densely populated. And so we, we are probably getting a bit more um, from the car tires, at least it, not just, uh, I'm thinking not just inhalation, but I'm, my interest is really in, the, in, my professional interest is in the drinking water. You know, there's not many countries that capture stormwater runoff for drinking water um, because it's hard to do. It's hard to build catchments. But Singapore has done unique in engineering the marina barrage. So my interest there would be to find out if because of this dense environment, because we do capture urban runoff as part of our drinking water supply, is that a unique exposure? But we don't have that answer at all at this point. Uh, Vanessa, we have some questions uh, in the Q&A chat box. Maybe I could read out the first. Uh, now that microplastic have made their way into our bodies, what is the next step? Uh, how do we get rid of it and how do we live with it? And even before uh, that, you know, in the environment, before it had a chance to enter our body, uh, perhaps this is a question for Shane. Uh, how uh, are there technologies available? to remove microplastic before it gets into our drinking water. So the environmental, I guess, um, cleanup uh, is for Shane and uh, for Sunny, uh, it will be after it makes its way to our bodies, uh, what should be the next step? Uh, so over to you first, Shane. Okay, so first of all, we in drinking water, we deal with all kinds of particles. So let's be clear that my, microplastics are just one piece of the overall net particles both in our air and our water, and especially in drinking water, we have call it turbidity, but we have specific ways that we settle particles out or we filter them with membranes. So to remove the microplastics from the drinking water, actually, I don't think would be a massive challenge, so to speak, except, except we have to remember that our distribution system is still using epoxies, it's still using different polymers, our water fixtures at home, the O-rings, there's always going to be plastic. So I don't think there's any way to escape it whatsoever, but I do think that we can do better in you know, optimizing the formulations, especially if they're guided by health impacts or, or wise decision-making. But to say that we can eliminate all exposure, I, I don't believe that at all. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I'll turn it over to Sunny, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe can I uh, uh, follow a relevant question? Is uh, the uh, does it matter of the source of the water, whether they are from local catchment or whether they are, for example, from recycled? Um, so, uh, does it matter, like in terms of the amount of the microplastic they are? I don't think we I don't think we know that. But it, the the point is though that once that the catchment may have different levels, for sure it will, right? But the technology that goes into the purification. The filtration systems and the coagulation and membranes, but although I just was thinking the membranes are made of plastic too, so I'm not sure if the membranes contribute to anything, maybe that'll be another research project we can get funded, but there is a lot of plastic, even in water treatment, especially in the more uh, membrane technologies where they are polymeric and even the pressure vessels they're entrained within are made of plastic as well. So um, I think it'll be hard to escape it, but yeah, the, the catchments will be different, but the water quality after treatment will depend on the, the, the treatment process itself. Right. Uh, so gentlemen, before I hand over to Vanessa to uh, manage the other question, maybe I could play the devil's advocate here. So microplastic, you know, as I've uh, typed in the chat box, it uh, could be just uh, one of the thousands of trace contaminants, right? Uh, are we playing this up uh, too much? Is there real evidence, you know, in terms of uh, public health uh, issues related to microplastic? What exactly, uh, you know, in terms of disease, does microplastic actually cause? So over to you guys. Um yeah, I would think that uh, the the risk is real. Um, I'm 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 uh, at least like uh, although like uh, I did mention that uh, like in terms of human studies there are not so many. Uh, so there are studies looking at association in humans uh, in a population scale, and also I think uh, animal models. Although we, we we can't say mouse are same as human, but uh, I think uh, there are commonalities in the biology, and also there are commonalities in the cell. So. Uh, I do think that uh, there are sufficient uh, 
evidence that, that we should be worried. Um, so um, the, the question is um, that uh, we know that microplastic is not the only thing. And even within microplastic, there are different microplastics. There are different shapes, mm -hmm. there are different sources, and there are different chemicals. Uh, so I would think that uh, the risk is there, and uh, but, mm -hmm. but we just need uh, more granularity to, to, to how, how they work. And how I, they work. Shane, what are your thoughts? I mean, every day we are bombarded uh, with all kinds of contaminants, you know, not just uh, the things that we ingest, but also the air we breathe, right? So where do we go from here? So, so for one, I'll, I'll go back to what you originally asked. I do think it's overplayed by a long stretch. I think that, you know, we, we jump from topic to topic. We love to be worried about things. And I worked on endocrine disruption. That was my PhD back in the 90s. We still haven't solved that. You know, the chemicals that are leaching from different types, of even plastics that cause, you know, uh, hormonal responses that mimic uh, our natural hormones. But it got, you know, that came and went, people don't talk about it anymore. Nanoparticles was hot for a while, and these are a kind of a type of nanoparticle, if you will, but that came and went, and then perfluorinated organics are here. We had perchlorate, you know, you can go back to all these different emerging contaminants that got tremendous media coverage. We'd never solved them as far as I'm concerned, but we just moved into the new cool thing that we could detect. And that I think is what's driving it is, is detectability. Because if we went back just a decade ago, it would have been very difficult to detect many of the microplastics that we're talking about today. It's the analytical that has outpaced. So my question would be, maybe Sunny can answer this, if we couldn't detect it, would we still be talking about it? Is there some kind of population level impact that we're worried about and we can't figure out what's causing it? So. Sometimes I, I do, I do, I do wonder whether uh, it's better not to know something. Then. <laughs> yeah. But the next question is then: uh, Is the technology that uh, there that we can detect them, but also to analyze them sufficiently mm -hmm. and also potentially to remove them? Yeah. Look, look, thank you. I'm just perhaps trying to influence the outcomes of the poll, but I'm very happy to note the, uh, that we have uh, questions uh, from the audience in a fast and furious manner. So over to you, Vanessa. Thanks, Kalim. Thanks, all. Yeah, it, it seems we're really stuck in this. How how severe is this problem? And, and a, another question from the audience. It's anonymous. So if you if you would like to engage with us with your real name and affiliation, please do add it to your question so we can we can shout out to you. Uh, is that uh, you know these medical conditions? So Sonia, I keep coming. Seems to be coming back to it together with the audience. <laughs> are, are there any suspected medical conditions that we that we expect from from this type of pollution in in our bodies? Um, yes, actually, uh, the, the, the potential harm is actually quite uh, pervasive. Uh, so uh, we talk about uh, the three roots uh, that we mentioned. Uh, so for example, the lung and uh, the, the gut and also the skin. And I think these are the immediate interface uh, that uh, might be susceptible. So uh, again, not many human studies, uh, but there are some that uh, did look at, for example, adding these microplastic into uh, lung epithelial cells and also gastrointestinal cell. And the uh, some of the evidence that they do cause uh, cytotoxicity, like cell damage uh, in uh, and uh, looking at the cell, looking at the DNA, they see damage as well. And also in some of the model, they see uh, what, what they commonly see is uh, uh, what we call inflammation as well. So uh, mm. they do uh, inflict some injury that the body seems to produce a response uh, to counteract uh, some of these changes. Uh, again, they are um, some of us, some are animal and their cell lines, uh, but uh, I think there are uh, studies uh, looking at these. So apart from the respiratory, I think uh, the skin, uh, there could be allergies and also uh, the uh, gastrointestinal tract. Uh, they also found uh, increased inflammation as well. And uh, the other uh, more potential organs that are affected um, uh, beyond this uh, system are, uh, for example, the metabolic system. So uh, whether uh, it affects the metabolism, uh, cancer, for example, and I think uh, reproductive system and also the neurological system are, are some of the other systems so, that were mentioned. So there's one question uh, from the audience about the lungs. It's kind of speculative, uh, if you're saying, but just wondering, does it have anything to do with increased incidence of lung cancers in non-smokers? Uh, Yes, uh, so we know that, uh, I think like the, the basis of this uh, is that uh, we know that lung cancer is actually the most common cancer that we have. And also uh, there are in some places a surge uh, in a middle age kind of, um, um, uh, especially among ladies, uh, the uh, 
uh, a type of uh, lung cancer as well. So, uh, and we didn't know the reason why. So people have hypothesized uh, that because these people don't smoke, it might be the pollution. Uh, some people uh, also hypothesized that it might be the kitchen environment that, that some of them are, are doing the cooking every day. And uh, so I don't think there is any- Oh, really? Really? So, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank goodness I'm not doing the cooking. So, you know, that, that, that saved me from that. I, I mean, really, are we all standing in the kitchen all day? I don't think so. Uh, probably, yeah, but, but some of them are, are, are not, not play up, but uh, yeah. It's a, yeah, I guess it, it, it shows how little is known, right? How little is known about the, the, the yes, kind exactly. of differences and, and between you... people from different genders and the impact of this type of pollution. Yes, exactly. And uh, actually, when you look at the disease trend, they're always up and down. And so people uh, correlate it with uh, different observations. Uh, some of them might be true, uh, but some of them, I think, are, are, are well, um, are beyond, well, we need more evidence for that. Right. It, sound, it, sound, it does sound highly speculative. Like, who knows, might be because the kitchen, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're at that point. Yep. We have no and, idea. And, and, so and of course, if you look at the air, there are, there, are, there, are, there are thousands of chemicals that you can look at. So um, um, there, 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 there could be many others that are more important. Okay. Uh, sorry, let me jump in uh, with a few related questions directed, I think, towards Shane. Uh, one is by Claudia, uh, who understand that we do not want all plastics to be biodegradable, but then what can be done with the plastic waste? And related to this, uh, there is a attendee uh, talking about upcycling, uh, but is this the end goal? And can plastic be upcycled continuously for long enough time for it to be sustainable? Let me uh, take on another related question that is an interesting uh, discovery uh, actually noted by San Jian Xiao, that saliva of silkworm seems to be able to decompose plastic in a natural way. Uh, this is related, I guess, to plastic management. Uh, to the other two questions, do we have more in-depth studies to show that we as humans can harness this uh, ability and maybe to also produce some medicine? So over to you, Shane. Okay, so so I'll, I'll take a really quick one at, at those three, I think. So the first one on the biodegradability, there's a lot of effort. In fact, my own research group has one grant uh, here in Singapore to look at biodegradable plastics. But I just want to put, point out that what we're looking at is what do they biodegrade into? And if we ignore that, then we are potentially creating something more dangerous than we already had. Just because something's natural or made with natural chemicals doesn't make it safe. And the fact that it can biodegrade also doesn't make it safe. Maybe it would protect us from the particle. But if we release hazardous chemicals, soluble or not, into the environment, that's not a good idea. So I think we just need to think of it holistically. Um, then the second question was on the upcycling and can we do it sustainably? First of all, I wanna make it clear, I'm not advocating for more plastic bottles and bags. I think, you know, if we could eliminate that, like what I keep calling the low hanging fruit, that's wise. We should be reducing our waste across the spectrum, not just in plastic, by the way, in my opinion, but we can, we can upcycle it. And I do think because we're not gonna eliminate plastic that that is an important component of, of the, you know, circular economy that we can take back and encourage people to not, you know, throw it in the ocean or let it run out into our into our streams and etc. But to bring it in and have it upcycled, and we can do this in a way that is at least economically viable. It will take energy, and we got to be honest about that fact. But we can do it in a way that I think would be at least a, a step in the right direction, if nothing else. And then I think I've already forgotten the third question, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it's on the silkworm. Oh, Okay, Benefit. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of work even here at um, NTU, including from Professor Serene Lim, who's looking at enzymatic ways to degrade plastic, which would be another fantastic um, um, feat if we can do that. Because ultimately, if we could get the plastic back into the monomers, back to the original materials that we synthesize plastic with, we could re-synthesize. Again, not to encourage waste, but to encourage mm -hmm. Uh, a more sustainable, you know, life cycle uh, for them. So if the silkworm or other enzymes have promise in the de de degradation, that is definitely of high value. Thank you, Shane. Just to assure you, I'm drinking from a cup instead of a plastic bottle. So over to you, Rachel. I got my metal one. Oh, you can't see it, it's invisible. Oh, yeah. 
so it, it, kind of going a little bit further on this, uh, how can we deal with it? There are there are two suggestions from the audience that I'd uh, like to run, run by you, Shane, and maybe Sonia, you can say something about uh, what what the alternatives to health impact might be. One of them is, you know, what about using paper? Is, is paper really uh, a, a good alternative? Paper straws, paper bags, etc. Uh, there seems to be some debate on that, so audience member is curious to know. The other is, uh, okay, if we can't avoid microplastics, and this is from Andy Prowl, who is also a director here at NIST, uh, uh, how can we deal with that in, say, an urban planning way? Can we kind of keep that water catchment far away from people or I have the process in between as much as possible? So two alternative ways to respond to this. Maybe to start with you, Shane. Yeah, I'll take a quick, the first one, I'm, I'm so happy to get the question about paper versus plastic. So I used to teach an entire course on life cycle assessment. And that was one of the big challenges I gave the students from day one. When they ask you at the store, paper or plastic bag, which one do you pick if you wanna be sustainable? And I, I don't have time to go deep into it, but here's a, a fascinating answer that we came up with. If you reuse that plastic bag over and over again, it is far more sustainable than the paper. And you can Google this, it's not very hard to, to find it, but what goes into paper and bleaching and actually recycling paper is not 100% sustainable either, by the way. I mean, it is, takes a lot of chemicals, produces a lot of waste. So it's why we have to think out of the box and not condemn plastics just immediately because we could end up uh, shooting ourselves in the foot with that. In terms of urban planning, I, that's an interesting, really high level way to think about it. You know, I, I keep coming back to the car tires because I'm just fascinated by that one in particular because I can't think of an alternative for car tires. Maybe somebody can, but I don't think paper will work. We probably tried wood, you know, 500 years ago or so, but um, <laughs> so there are certain products that are gonna be very hard to, to eliminate and in urban planning to try to avoid being near roadways, I know here in Singapore, they're building some model communities where the cars will be underground, as I understand it. Mm. So there, there certainly could be a way to at least try to minimize our exposure, but uh, I, I'm not as familiar with the urban planning side. Uh, let me jump back in again, because I really like uh, the last question uh, so far, uh, or because I'm the devil's advocate, right? So Sunny, uh, this is for you. Understanding the biomedical sciences on the impact of microplastic is uh, quite pupative, nascent. Uh, so currently the site studies are mostly cell level studies. So do we really have a clear view on how microplastic affect the whole system in animal studies? Example, respiratory system in mice. I think you have commented a little bit. Maybe you can elaborate on this. Uh, yes, I think like uh, the, um, the the usual um, like to establish the uh, possibility. I think like uh, we we need uh, cell models and we need, need animal models as well. And I think like uh, the um, um, as we mentioned, uh, the cell model there are there are some data that uh, and uh, looking at different um, uh, microplastics. And uh, I think it will be important to move into uh, the system model as well because uh, we when we. In biology, we talk about the cell, the cell together makes the tissue, and then it's the organ. And of course, we can look at it from a cellular angle and look at the all the molecular cellular changes. Uh, but ultimately, when we move or when we want to look at the effects, I think it is the system, the organ that is important. So I think like that would be an important part. And uh, we have like animal, but then uh, actually there are different ways that we can do. We can look at environmental. So already the living organisms that are exposed and also we can do it in, in laboratory in other settings as well. So there are different ways that we can look at that. No, but where are we now in terms of detecting microplastic in the human body and have some, I guess, uh, confidence that uh, it is not only correlated, uh, but it can be causative. Uh, so uh, right now, I think there are animal studies uh, that look at exposure to these microplastics. So this is not only cellular work, but also uh, laboratory uh, animal work. I'm talking uh, about human body, human body. Uh, human I mean... body, yes, uh, not, not, not so much. So some I've mentioned are association studies. So for right. example, the new studies that I mentioned uh, look at people with uh, colitis, gut information, and uh, compare the level. And there are studies looking at uh, finding the uh, microplastic in the blood and also in the stool that I've mentioned. 
on the biological effects, uh, not so many. Some have looked at, for example, specific uh, parameter. So for example, a few studies look at the microbiome, how exposure, they, they, they measure the, the changes in the um, microbiome as a surrogate. But in terms of the organ function, in terms of the overall health, uh, I don't see much uh, being done over there. And Vanessa, if you don't mind, let me follow up with something very quickly, because at the end of the day, uh, it seems that, yes, you know, this is probably something that is of concern, but perhaps uh, not quite sufficient study to indicate the causality, but perhaps something that we want to take note of. But at the end of the day, it's really about our behavior in relation to our environment, right? When you think about it, if everybody is civic-minded enough, there will be no plastic in the oceans, there will be no plastic contaminants uh, you know, in reservoirs that uh, at the end of the day stream back uh, to our digestive system. So is this perhaps a matter of policy implementation? And that relates to one of the questions that the attendees has asked. Uh, so Shane, uh, perhaps uh, you can comment on this. Maybe uh, you know, things would be more effective if it is actually uh, related to certain policy implementation, do you think this is feasible? I think it's very, very difficult. And I think what, what one of the challenges is that all of us seem to default back to the plastic bottles and plastic bags when the fact is that our clothing is the number one source, at least in terms of uh, what's entering the ocean. I think several studies have pointed that out. So how do we limit textiles and how do we have pol policies around limiting synthetic fibers in clothing? I think that that is for me, very difficult to imagine. But I do, again, agree that, you know, there's certain, like, uh, things we could do um, to try to eliminate, or not try, it won't eliminate, but to reduce the loading to the environment and to reduce our exposure um, by trying to limit and upcycle the waste that we do produce. But again, this topic is far beyond just the plastic bags and bottles. And it, I was just going to point out, when we do laboratory studies, by the way, I do a lot of in vitro work, what do we use? a lot of plastic, 96 well plates, 384 well plates, and pipette tips. These are all plastic, our gloves, et cetera. So if we, we got to be honest here, you know, and <laughs> if we're going to try to eliminate plastic, what would the world look like? And I invite everyone on the call to think about that for a minute. Everything around you disappears. It becomes wood and stone. It's going to be mm -hmm. a much different world. <laughs> yeah. But I guess this is yeah. where uh, science and humanity uh, interact uh, because uh, I, I don't think only advocate uh, we, we will be because it's so much of the convenience. So actually it takes the psychology bit of it. It takes the policy bit of it and, and it takes uh, a behavioral science bit of it as well. Yeah, I'm indeed uh, glad you say that because I was going to direct a question to my co-host, uh, Vanessa, in terms of feasibility of implementation as we heard from Shane. And just to provide an anecdote, uh, I guess, um, evidence, uh, you know, I was talking to one of my colleagues uh, with regards to maybe not using that much uh, plastic uh, bags from NTUC supermarket. And she say that, look, you know, um, if we eliminate all this uh, and we want to bag our refuse, we want to throw our, uh, this um, uh, waste, uh, you know, uh, kitchen waste out, then what do you use if you do not use plastics, right? So, so those are really convenient for us to bag our waste and throw it. So. So it's, it's actually at the intersection between science and humanities. Vanessa, I'm going to arrow you. To, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll solve it just like that. No, I, I mean, medicine is also a highly plastic using uh, cohort, right? I mean, when you enter a hospital, uh, basically you're just wrapped in plastic and everything that's, <laughs> that's used on you is, is made out of plastic. There's a question by Anderson Thiel in the Q&A saying, okay, he's curious on where we are now on biodegradable waste, like in needles and plastics in terms of our current COVID problem. I mean, we've seen that as soon as something, we're working towards no plastic, but as soon as something happens, all our good efforts are thrown out of the door because, oh my God, you know, uh, there's COVID here and we need to, again, wrap ourselves in a big plastic hamster ball and go around uh, around the city, walking, uh, walking around in plastic and using lots of plastic. So. Uh, I guess there's a bunch of questions to, mm -hmm. to get out of this question is, mm -hmm. are we actually using more and more plastic when it comes to COVID happening and, and healthcare kind of ramping up as we are aging? Um, it also sounds like, Shane, even if we would replace everything with stone and wood, plastic is still here to stay. I mean, it, it is there. 
uh, it's in the environment. Um, so it, it's really, it seems to be really about, uh, yeah, how, how, do we, how do we mitigate the effects of plastic and, and how do we kind of upcycle out of, out of places where we can't get it out, like, like human blood or something like that. Uh, yeah, where, where are we on that? Is it true that's just more and more plastic? And B, um, what is seemingly the best way forward on dealing with getting plastic out of our bodies or making sure it doesn't get into our bodies. Actually, I wonder whether COVID increased our, our, our plastic use because like in the beginning and still now, like with the bin, like it's just full of the different masks. And we know that there are nylon, there are, there are plastic in it. But of course, COVID probably does change our life in many different ways. So we could reduce our use uh, in, in other aspects. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I'll, I'll just chime in on the on the um, you know again on how we could do better with what we what we are using because I don't again I don't see it going down. In fact, I do see polymers in general continue to 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 grow. So I think what we can do is just incrementally chip away at it. I mean, again, take the things that we know that we can help keep the plastics out of the ocean and try to reduce the amount of single-use plastic, which I think nobody will debate um, is, 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 is a shame and a wasteful in terms of energy. But I, I also still believe that we have to be thinking about how to upcycle our waste in general, not just the polymeric, and then developing new formulas that hopefully are not toxic. I don't believe that all plastic is toxic. I don't believe that at all. I think that it's going to be certain forms, like we've learned a lot about polycarbonates, which was historically leached a lot of bisphenol A, which is a compound that has been studied since the 1950s, known estrogen receptor agonist. So I don't know. For me, I think you know, we, we have a long way to go, but um, I wanted to leave this with one thought too. You know, When it comes to plastic bottles that we pick on, I'll take all the plastic bottles I can get because they are very easy to upcycle. So that is like, not maybe exactly as we hear, but I did see, I think in, in Professor Wong's slide that that the uh, bottled water had more microplastics than almost anything else, at least that one figure. So that kind of intrigued me, but um, yeah, it's a tough one to get our mind around. I don't think we can globally say all plastics need to go. Uh, I'd be uh, impressed if someone could do that. <laughs> Right. Yeah, it does seem like seems like a strong dichotomy. to me. So I guess we get out of this, and maybe the, the last question we can we can address uh, before we finish our think out session is is by Marcus, and um, it's kind of like a vision of how big of a threat is this in the future. It seems like right now we know it's there. We know it has some effect. We know it's impacting people's health. At least we think it's impacting people's health. And we're figuring out to what extent. We're also figuring out what are ways to make sure these particles don't end up in the human body. Um, it, it doesn't. It's hard to say if it's a huge, huge threat now. But, but in your expert opinion, do you think this is something that could be or become uh, a very important societal challenge for us to focus on? I think it's a huge threat for the environment. And uh, for health, uh, I, 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 I suspect so. So uh, I do uh, appreciate that uh, there, are, there are effects, there are worries that we have, but uh, as Shen has mentioned, uh, probably not all of them have the same effect. There are different plastics, there are different chemicals, and I'm sure actually some might be neutral, some might have more effects and they, they are not uniform. So I would think that they are huge threats to the environment uh, in, in terms of plastic in general. Uh, health, uh, I'm, I'm not sure myself. Yeah, what do you think? Oh. Yeah, I mean, I just, again, you know, from, from my point of view, I, I think mostly about the oceans and water, so I'm a bit biased that way. But I think trying to keep the plastics out of the ocean would be a good way to start, at least from mm -hmm. the environmental perspective, because this is, I think, a senseless uh, way to dispose of plastics. So, you know, we have entire rivers in parts of Indonesia that are just literally like just all floating styrofoams and plastics. So I think, you know, offering technologies to try to get that plastic out of the environment and hopefully upcycle it into something of value is something we should start on right away. I mean, there's, there's no, no reason not to do that. In terms of the plastics that are used in healthcare, in our clothing, in our tires, uh, I have to admit, I don't really have a good suggestion on that one, but um, I'm sure the science will, will continue to prevail mm -hmm. and push forward. 
Uh, so Vanessa and panelists, I believe uh, we all agree that we have an interesting, we had a fun and productive uh, discussion. Uh, maybe before we go to the poll, uh, could we perhaps invite the panelists and maybe you, uh, Vanessa, to just have uh, one concluding statement as a takeaway for the session today? Maybe starting with uh, Shane. <laughs> I think I just said it, but I'll be I'll say mm -hmm. my concluding statement is, look, we need to reduce how much things we waste and we need to reuse whatever we can. And I think, you know, with the plastics, let's think carefully about how much of it we dispose of after a single use and try to use glass or alternatives uh, where it makes sense. Sunny? Uh, I would say that uh, the uh, one simple message is uh, to watch out and think out uh, the um, uh, it is an important part of the environment that has uh, potential effects on us, uh, on the microbes, on the environment. And uh, so uh, think out is the, the word that I want to use. So Vanessa, before we go to you uh, to actually comment on the final poll and also to provide your concluding remarks, maybe allow me uh, to put on my neuroscientist cap uh, to just say also uh, some few words uh, on microplastics. Uh, there are certainly evidence uh, showing that uh, microplastic can actually uh, infiltrate the brain and cause substantial oxidative damage to the brain and promoting uh, neurodegeneration. So this is actually something of concern. Uh, so my concluding statement is that whilst we want the brain to be plastic uh, in terms of reacting to situation, we call it neuroplasticity. Uh, certainly, we don't want the brain to contain plastic. So that's uh, what uh, I want to convey. So uh, let me hand over to you, Vanessa, uh, to provide the concluding remarks and to comment on the poll. Let's see how much of it influenced the audience. Thanks, Carl Young. Thanks, uh, Shane and Sunny. Since this is a medical think out, I think this is a perfect uh, perfect finishing comment, Carl Young, uh, with, with your reflection on that. And indeed, we don't want I think we don't want blast brains. No, who's it? It, it might be the next uh, hip thing, but uh, I think we don't want it in our brains for sure. So if we close the poll, uh, the closing poll is basically the same question to see if people have have uh, yeah, a different opinion after thinking about plastics and, and the human body and our health in a way. So while uh, the poll is up and you're putting in your questions, I'll, I'll end, uh, do the closing statements. And that is that we are now at the end of our Think Out debate. And our thanks go to you, Prof Schneider, your widely known expert in water research and Prof Wong, a medical expert and you specialize in micro research. It was really wonderful to have your thoughts on this, on this important topic. And uh, as a token of our appreciation, the first Think Out, which is made out of metal, it's a huge collector's item, is coming your way. And audience, thank you so much for your participation. Please follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you name it, to learn more about this debate series, but especially to access the research papers and more information on today's uh, debaters. Um, we really look forward to you all joining us in our next Think Out. And here's the closing poll. And we can see that actually people have moved a little bit more towards probably from definitely yes so we are slightly less worried but in general we are still very worried about microplastics and human body and uh, as we've learned today that is so we really look forward to you all joining us for our next out it will be about how uh, popular culture movies shape our acceptance of robots on the 16th of november and in January, we will be back with a new medical think out uh, to address. So looking forward to that. Be sure to register and join the discussion. Thank you so much, all. <laughs> okay, thank good. You all. Yeah, thank you again to the panelists. Thank you, Vanessa, for having me here. And thank you to the wonderful audience for your Q&A and your participation. Really a pleasure. Have a good day, everyone. Vanessa, thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. -bye.